I was reflecting on what would be relevant to CERC and I actually thought some vignettes from a class that I actually recently took um, would, or rather taught, sorry, uh, would, be, would be really great to, to kind of highlight. Um, in particular, I co-designed a class. Uh, it's called AI Decision Making in Society and I taught it with Manish Raghavan, who's at Sloan, as well as Alexander Madri. Um, and this was an undergrad class and there were a lot of interesting ideas uh, related to foundation models and what are the challenges and opportunities there. Um, I must mention this class was an extension of a class developed by Asu and Alexander taught at the graduate level. Okay, so let me figure out how to... There we go. All right, so this talk is going to be concerned with uh, foundation models. These are models that are trained on large-scale internet data. Um, so they're often common crawlers that scrape internet data and provide uh, this data, this internet data kind of grab writ large to these uh, companies who then train these large language models or these diffusion models and they're open to the public. I'm sure many of you guys have actually explored a lot of these models. And so in the class I taught, we were really trying to get at the heart of what are some of the concerns surrounding this, this new exciting space of large language models and diffusion models. Um, and so we broke it up into about five sections. Um, and there were several projects and interesting ideas that I want to highlight as to how to remedy some of these concerns, um, one of which I, I turned into a project with a student of mine. But the first concern I want to highlight is copyright and fair use. So uh, there have been several high, high, profile, article, high profile articles about uh, concerns about copyright and fair use. So as an example, uh, stable diffusion image journey are, are being sued by certain artists uh, who, who feel that they, their art was stolen. Uh, and actually, as I was sitting in the back, as I walked in, uh, my New York Times banner came up um, with a headline for uh, uh, Reddit trying to now charge companies for using their data for these large language models. So it's just kind of this ongoing evolution of, of various kind of very upfront topics. This actually happened a lot while, I was te while we were teaching the class, just a lot of breaking news stories that were extremely relevant to the content we were, we were talking about. Um, so, there's also this right to be forgotten, and a huge chunk of our class discuss the privacy and how, how to achieve privacy. But also at an abstract level, you know, Europe's laws, as you might know, kind of take the right to be forgotten way more seriously, or they're, they're forward thinking, more forward thinking than, than US laws. But it is true that most Americans, at least according to some surveys, support the right to have some of their personal information removed upon request. And so it it's, remains to be seen whether this will become a standard in the US setting. Um, nevertheless, we, we were looking at tools and ways of thinking through how to actually enact such a policy uh, at scale. We also had uh, one student in particular who was really, really excited about developing new economies of large data. Um, so in our class, we had a large debate about whether people should be paid for their data. And how would a data market look? And so we had various proposals for what an intermediary would look like and how, how such a new economy based on large scale da data might be developed. Um, I wish I could highlight that project more. I actually think there were some very innovative ideas there. Um, but you know, a lot of people are proposing different tools such as Shopley values or other kinds of attribution models to pay people. And there's questions about how stable and fair that might be actually in the end. One thing that I actually really thought is a very emergent uh, concern is the idea that there might be just a concern about scaling, um, having, having models that operate at scale. So my colleague, my co-teacher in this class, Manish Raghavan uh, and John Kleinberg have a paper about uh, algorithmic monoculture, this idea that if a lot of companies are sharing the same data or the same models, that it is somehow suboptimal, both, well, they were talking about it from a company's perspective, 
But this idea of outcome homogenization also looks at it from a user perspective. So here we have an empirical study. This was a paper produced out of Stanford where they showed that if there are models that share a lot of the same data, then this outcome homogenization effect is quite severe in a lot of these large language models. They also showed that what they termed system systemic failure, uh, the phenomenon whereby an unlucky candidate receives no interviews or just no positive outputs from a model occurs, can actually be exacerbated again by outcome homogenization. This is the, or rather, by, by the phenomenon whereby models are shared across organizations or data is shared at scale across organizations. And of course, there's the infamous topics of bias and robustness. Um, I need not highlight there, this was kind of highlighted in our class where uh, large language models in this study looked at GPT-2 um, and showed there's this systematic preference for stereotypical data um, over, over less stereotypical data. So uh, unclear if GPT-4 has, has this phenomenon happening, but I'm sure there'll be a paper release tomorrow which will will analyze it, you know, it's just kind of this new information happening at large with these new models coming out. Right, so our, 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 the project I want to talk about and, and our class, like I said, concentrated a lot on privacy. Um, and differential privacy in general is, is held up as a gold standard for privacy. And yet, most of the models I, I discussed uh, do not actually train their models to be differentially private. And I was asking actually some engineers why, and they were like, oh, of course, there's this utility privacy trade-off and we don't need to. <laughs> it's large internet data, why, why preserve privacy? Um, and so, indeed, there have been many, many papers of which I'm highlighting one about empirical study that showed this trade-off, of course, between uh, your privacy budget and your accuracy loss. Uh, this, hopefully, for the privacy practitioners should not be much of a surprise. But then the question is, should companies be actually training their models to be differentially private? Um, this is in particular because copyright protection is a concern. And there's not a gold standard of a technique that will preserve this. So we have a lot of filtering algorithms that try and filter out copyrighted data. But when you're talking about large internet data, it is extremely hard to do this. Then the gold standard now is also to develop tools for attribution of data to model output to then try and figure out which data contributed and whether that data is indeed copyrighted. Um, and so I'll talk about what those techniques are, but there are no formal guarantees for whether these, model, these tools will work and there's no way, of course, to do this. And so this is where I think uh, statistics, my, hopefully my students in my class and, and then you guys here <laughs> can actually come up with ideas for how to actually do this at scale. So I mentioned a lot of problems. Um, and I want to talk about one technique that comes from very, very classical robust statistics of handling a lot of these concerns. Uh, this is influence functions. This is uh, very, very classical by Bradley Efron and, and, and Jekyll. Um, and the idea is to, to use this kind of um, calculation of differentiating through the training data, so a first order approximation. To, to a perturbation in the data to figure out how much a data point is contributing to a model's output. This has been used for copyright compliance, for attribution, for robustness checks, debugging, fairness concerns, and the like. So this is kind of used at a lot of places. I, I felt it would be remiss if I had, didn't have a talk that actually displayed some math. So <laughs> I just threw up some of the equations for, for what these uh, influence functions look like in these various regimes. Um, in principle, these, these uh, updates to the model or, or kind of this classical measure of how much data is related is, is a quick calculation. Uh, I'm just not, I'm not going to unpack these equations, just trust they're, they're, they're well motivated and well studied. Um, there have been some really nice papers that have come out using these influence functions to highlight some really interesting phenomenon. Uh, one in particular is spearheaded by a colleague of mine, Tamara Broderick, and, and people in her group, um, as well as Rachel Meager. And they showed that m there are various high-profile economic um, outputs that can be, that 
that are sensitive to the data. That is, when a little data is chopped, dropped, these findings change drastically. So I thought this was a really, really interesting use of, of these perturbation analyses. There's also a group out of Carnegie Mellon that proposed that these leave one out models, these influence functions, should be fundamentally a notion of fairness. Um, in particular, they show that if you drop a data point, the decision boundary changes drastically and for a large number of data sets. Your ultimate decision, whether you're diagnosed with something, whether you receive a loan, can be sensitive to just whether one data point is in your training data. And somehow this is kind of undesirable, or this lack of robustness is very, very undesirable. And so what to do about that? How to even detect whether this is going on in, in hidden and in, in neural networks? So I just want to go through when we understand these techniques work, when they work at scale, and, and what's left to do here. Um, so as I said, they, they're used for robustness and model selection, and there's a lot known about when this does and does not work. Um, in particular, what is well known is that they do tend to work when you have nice models, models that have some nice convexity property, um, and work with uh, Max Casey, who presented earlier today, and Lester Mackey, we were able to, to carve out instances in which uh, this will work, even for non-smooth models. Um, so too, with approximate unlearning, we were able to show that for a very similar class of functions, these unlearning techniques should, should actually work. Um, and that's a really good, uh, good thing, because they tend to have dramatically uh, dramatic speed ups for, for when you're trying to uh, analyze whether your, your model is robust or your attribution model or whether your, your attribution model works. So, so in some cases, we're getting on the order of 2,000 speed ups. So ideally, these things would work and they can work in these large language model settings. However, there are some severe uh, limitations. Even for, non, for very, very nice models, they actually do not work um, for very specific use cases, like if you were using uh, influence functions for model selection, even for a basic objective like the lasso, it does not reliably work. Um, it might work in, on average, but it definitely doesn't reliably work. And so too, uh, it does not preserve privacy if you do any kind of hyperparameter tuning. So most of the uh, learning algorithms out there, the techniques developed to remove data points actually fail to, to remove those data points um, if hyperparameter tuning is involved, which for most cases it is. So they actually don't work well at large uh, for a large variety of models. Um, and so, and the last thing I wanna really much, very much mention is we, we show that for a nice class of models they tend to work, but for deep learning, they can be deeply unreliable. So there have been several papers I'm just highlighting too, which illustrate that influence functions, while pervasively used, uh, tend to fail to uh, replicate the gold standard, which is simply removing the data or simply, simply doing kind of the, the retraining. So this motivates some of these kind of open questions that people in my group, as well as some of the students in my class, are pursuing, which is, when can we, uh, can we actually develop reliable and scalable methods for addressing these concerns in foundation models? Um, and so that's just kind of an open question that perhaps some people in this audience might be interested in, but I actually think these statistical tools will be really fundamental in addressing some of these social concerns when it comes to these now really interesting and models that are everywhere. So, I leave that as kind of a, a vignette to, for you guys to perhaps understand where a lot of people are, are really interested in, in tackling some of these, these problems. And with that, I will, I will end. Thank you for your attention. Uh, any questions? Oh, not deep learning. I said the techniques for unlearning, as in removing data from models. Oh, 
are unreliable. And they tend to be unreliable for, for deep networks, not necessarily shallow ones. Oh, I Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah. There are specific instances where you can, you can show exactly when they become unreliable. Whether, whether it's direct or not, isn't there already? Yeah. Uh, I mean, whether the data is personal or, or large or it comes from somewhere, it goes somewhere, mm -hmm. isn't there already an economy that's attached to that? Absolutely. The concern is that it contributes to inequality. And, and so trying to restructure uh, kind of this new attention economy in a way that actually helps support a middle class, that people actually get paid what their data is worth is is something that people are interesting like interested in. What would that look like? Um, and so, yeah, just more spelled out. Uh, what would data brokers do? How would people actually price their data and the like? So that's a very interesting kind of economic model to study.